And this is where I always tell people, look, follow the money. It requires effort, it requires engagement, true engagement. You gotta say yes. Some way, somehow, say yes. That's where the innovation comes. We cannot be complacent. Welcome everyone to episode 27 of Move Crush Count, a podcast produced and sponsored by j &L Marketing. I'm your host, Scott Joseph. Special guest with us today, Mr. John Traver, Traver Connect, as well as a, a multitude of other successful businesses. Uh, John is an expert when it comes to innovation. Today we are going to talk to you about how to innovate better. Innovation is critical. It is a must-have if you want long-term success and you want consistent growth. So John's gonna walk us through that. Let's introduce John. You're listening to Move Crush Count, hosted by Scott Joseph. Welcome everyone to Move Crush Count. This is a podcast produced by j &L Marketing, also sponsored by j &L Marketing. I am your host, Scott Joseph. We got a special guest today, Mr. John Traver from Traver Connect. A lot of other companies we'll get into as well. Uh, but I want to make sure we get that one out there. We got the sign out on the building. He not only graciously agreed to share his experience uh, and his knowledge, which runs very deep, uh, but he's also hosting us uh, today. Beautiful complex, but it, and let me tell you, I think it really goes well with what we're going to talk about, and that's how to innovate better. Your whole office screams innovation, uh, mm -hmm. and so we can get into some of the specifics as we go on, but. I want to say thank you and welcome. Scott, we're honored to be with you today. We're excited about the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So let's jump in. Let's jump right in and, and give everybody a little bit of the history of your background, some of your experience, and where you're coming from so they can get, better understand who you are. Great. Well, I, you know, I got in the business in 1991, uh, actually 1986. I've owned my own company since 1991. And I, you know, I as I look back on my background, I kind of sometimes wonder, would I have been a better employee than maybe uh, an employer? And um, I'd have been the worst employee. Would you? <laughs> I, I'd have been horrible. I, I mean, I look back and I think, you know, I there were things I was paying attention to, kind of like you and I today as we walk through the complex. Um, you know, we're picking each other's brains and how we do business and so forth. Um, so I think I was always sort of like, okay, I would probably do it like this. Yeah. Or, oh, I love how they did that. So I was always sort of looking at what was behind what was going on. Um, so, and I think I've always had an interest in treating people right. I, I owe my dad a lot of credit. I was actually adopted at seven. Um, and my dad, and it was a great process for me, honestly. So, but my dad was a simple man. Um, and he treated the president or the janitor the same. And it was always, Hey kid, or how you doing today, sir? But there was nobody that was a stranger. And I think, what I took from that was we're all equal. And so to me, that was one of the cool things about business is being reminded about how powerful a business can be in people's lives. Yeah. What you and I can do, what others that are watching this podcast can do through and with their businesses and how we can change lives. Yeah. Yes, we're delivering product, but there you go. What kind of things have you experienced? Let's stay on this topic of innovation, especially disruptive innovation, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of things have you experienced over the years? So you, you get started in what, 91? Yes. Right? How many different businesses are we talking about? Uh, <clears throat> today I have four. Okay. Um, I sold let, one. Let's do a, a quick plug on them. You want, you want to kind of walk <laughs> down? Well, you know, I stepped off from Russ Darrow Dealer Group in Wisconsin, and I got to tell you, unplug, Russ was the right person at the right stage of my life. Hired yep. me as a director of training operations for them in Wisconsin, 12 yep. stores. And I, that's where I kind of learned the macro of the business, right? I could see the systems and, and he gave me latitude. And so I think that's where I began to see the gap between like we were spending 60 grand a month in advertising. Okay. Yep. But we didn't spend two cents on developing our people so that they could take those leads that companies like J&L creates yep. and actually convert them. And that means something to you, right? That's right. I mean, you're making the phone ring but we're supposed to be desking deals and hopefully delivering vehicles. And so our ability to interact with that customer was, was a thing. So there's this, there was this huge gap that he allowed me to see. Um, so I think for me in automotive retail, it started at Traver Technologies in Houston. Um, that was the sales BDC. And the concept that I had there was 
I saw the antiquation of the automobile retail process, right? I mean, it was quickly getting old, throwing the keys on the roof. The average customer didn't take five days anymore in 1991. I mean, you went from 200 vehicles and models to 600 vehicles and models to 909 vehicles and models per JD Powers. Back then, I remember the shopping dynamics study. Seriously, I remember this. And it happened in like eight years, brother. So (laughs) it's like more vehicles. Cars went from five grand to 10 grand to 20 grand in median price in the same time. So more cars, more money, more time. Yeah. People stretched out the buying process, but we were still <clears> trying <throat> to jam people in cars, you know? And so I think the question that I asked back then is how Traver was really about how do we improve a customer experience that's antiquated, that's outdated. And so everything we did at Traver Tech was about that. So you talk about disruptive innovation. Right. It was, we were innovating. Okay, we weren't going to change the car business. Like we talk about digital re- retailing today. Yep. And there's some wedding still required in some states. And okay, that's a whole nother podcast probably. Yep. But the gap in for, for me was, first of all, advertising versus training. Like I talked about before, we spent a lot of money, but we didn't spend a lot on the people to get them ready. Um, fresh ups versus appointment business. For me, when I got involved on the showroom floor, I realized quickly, hey, look, it's easier to make a living with people that like and trust me than people I've never met before. Yeah. And so I need a balance. Is how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to live off phone ups. I'm going to do a better job at follow up. I'm going to ask for referrals and I'm going to grow this thing. Um, the other thing that was not evident and the BDC kind of helped was careers. I mean, it gave us this picture of you had high turnover in sales, but now we had a roadmap for people. And then the last thing that we were chasing was development of people. So managers, your typical, your best salesperson was tomorrow's manager. Right. And they didn't always make a great manager, no. did they? Right. And so it was like, well, there's no real roadmap for that. So to me, the BDM, some of, some of the folks may be listening. That was my vision was, okay, this is a person we first of all take, we can make them great on the phone. And what's great about that is what I do on the phone, I also do face to face. So like when I'm handling objections, I can practice with keywords and phrases and I can build, does that make sense? Yes. I can build confidence and okay, now what I'm face to face and literally that's what happened. So I look back, Mark Rogers, John Elway was a salesperson, a BDM. And the last time I checked, he's a platform president for AutoNation. Yeah. You know, so to me, that's, there's a lot there. So I think you look for the gaps and that's what happened for us today. BDC is an accepted model. It has its issues today. It too needs to be innovated, right? Um, in, in another space, I have a self-storage BPO. It's called XPS Solutions. And the question there is, how do we deliver a front counter experience over the phone with customers or tenants that we can't, we don't see? Right. And that's kind of a question for automotive today too, right? We do, yeah. we do a lot of this. And so the gaps in, at XPS were integration to the, basically the DMSs, right? Payment processing, um, there's a PCI compliance that you got to, and there's a, a spike of when those payment requests come in. It's the end of the month. So people don't get late fees. Um, we developed a mobile app. So we looked at the experience and how difficult the properties left that relationship. So like right now, if you have a unit storage in Louisville, you have to remember what your gate code is. You got to remember what your door code is, but we have an app called my store pal that you go in. And if that property is a member with us, you just log in your info. Everything's there. You can give it to your bride. She can go in. There's Instagram pictures of what's stored, where it's stored. Nice. You can do your payments through there. Now, we gave up some revenue to do that, but we knew that's where it was going, and we wanted to be part of the change. So that's part of our own, disrupting even our own game plan, right, as we got into it. And then uh, in 04, we have an agricultural play as well. It's Third Day Ranch. And <clears throat> when we started, you know, the question there was, and you're noticing these all start with a question. Yeah. So the question there was, how do we contribute to the protein cycle? And, and so we started where everybody else started, with cattle, right? Well, there's beef and that's protein. And we need protein as human beings to live, right? And so we got up to 450 animal units. We went from commercial to registered. We spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on herd sires and dams and genetics so that per pounds and all, moderating the herd and all these things I learned, they were all learnable things, yeah. right? Um, but we got to a place, and the metric there that you were taught was dollars per AU, per animal unit, okay? Yeah. So that's like units in operation in the car business, right? right? Yep. So if you have $600 of revenue, that's a calf that's produced each year, let's say, um, and you have 100, well, you have 60000 a year, 
yeah. right? That's your that's your revenue per annum is six hundred. So I was super paradigm paralyzed on that, and uh, we sprigged. One of the things we had in play was to improve some of the grasses, and so we sprigged with what's called uh, it's it was Tifton eighty five. It's a hybrid Bermuda grass, and it's a high end hay. Uh, protein content is high, uh, keeps weight on the cattle. And so we peeled the cattle off. We added irrigation. Well, the first time we cut, I couldn't measure dollars per animal unit because we're not talking animals. We're talking acres. So I just, in my head, I said, well, let's, what's dollars per acre? And that number was a sizable number. And I thought, gosh, what if I just asked that same question for cattle? So I took all the acreage, right, four digits of land, and I'm like, okay, what's the dollars per acre with cattle? Well, that answer was here, and the forage answer was here. So then the next question in terms of disruptive innovation, again, disrupting even ourselves, because we were committed to the question, how do we contribute to the protein cycle, right? Right. So we're talking 6, 7x in revenue. Wow. Yes. So what we did is we began to migrate our plan towards that. And today we have semi-trucks that deliver vans full of hay in hundreds of stores in the three-state region um, every day. So a couple of things that, that stand out to me and with, with what you just said. Early on, you had mentioned uh, that you weren't trying to change the industry. And this is back on the auto side. You weren't trying to change the industry. You were just trying to do it better. And if you think about the things that the, the greatest, the Internet didn't change the industry. It disrupted the industry in the sense that it still answered the question, all right, how can we do things better? Well, people want information quicker. They want it faster, right? And many times I, I want things less expensive. If, and the Internet provided opportunities for customers to get that. Uh, and so it wasn't that it changed. They're still buying cars. They're still buying them from dealers. They're still doing all those things that they've done. It's just a different path to get there. So it's not change, it's a disruption, right? And so the other thing that I that stood out to me with what you just said is, and this has come across on a lot of different podcasts, you know your numbers. You're, you're good. So when you're asking, you say you start with these questions, right? You're asking it yourself intelligent questions, all right, which force you to go inside your head and sit there and come up with better answers, to solve issues. And so you're sitting here thinking, all right, what's my this? What's my that? And and so I just love that approach. Uh, with, the, with with I wrote that down, starting with questions. I, I, I really like that. I think the difference between why me and how can I solve this yeah. is the question asked. Yeah. And you have a choice. You know, as, as life kind of punches you in the mouth, you can say, why me? You can't. Yeah. You, you're entitled. You're not going to like the answer. Because sometimes your brain's even going to lie to you. It's going to say, well, you deserve it. Well, you haven't done enough. Well, you may have done a ton, but your brain will do that to you. Yeah. But if you say, okay, how do we power through this? Okay, how do we take and learn? How can I say good, as Jocko would say? How can I say good? All right, so we got a roadblock. Now what? Right? Yeah. Now what? How do, how, do we, how do we grow from this? How do we get a deeper bent? Look, it comes down to our question. So for me, yes, I'm always chasing the questions in the best questions, I typically believe there's probably a better one out there somewhere. Yeah. Somebody said uh, the what polio are some vaccine. Of the best so you've given some examples already, but what are some of the best questions that you like to start? Yeah. Well, like when you're down this road, right, yeah. of, of, all right, let's, let's just take your, let's just take Traver Connect. Yes. All right. You've got a certain amount of revenue coming in. Yep. All right. Uh, you want growth. So a lot of people, you started this company how long ago? Ninety. Oh, that one started in 2011. All I right, didn't so get to Traver Connect, but yes. All yes. right, so 2011. So I, I, when you started this company, right, you're, so you're nine years in. Yeah. It's, it's a decent amount of time, yes. especially with what you're doing. Yes. And so a lot of times there are a lot of business leaders that might say, well, you know what? We've done it. We've arrived, Right. But you're always looking for growth. So what are the type of questions you ask when you feel like there's no more market share to get? There's no more profit to get, right? These car dealers that might be listening, they're sitting there. I've already raced to the bottom on stuff. I'm already doing, executing the best I can in F&I. Uh, what is the question they need to ask? What we started with at Traver was not what we're asking today at Traver Connect. Beautiful. So what I would tell you is this, that I walked in with a different question. 
it wasn't the right one. Yeah. So I lost time. Yeah. But so the fact that you're asking that question says, hey, you guys might not be asking the right question. Yep. And it's true. So with Traver, I lost years. Yep. And and that first question wasn't the right one. The second one wasn't, it was closer, but it still wasn't the right one. The question is for us today is simple. How can we impact positively the customer experience at the point of contact for the dealership through the service lane? Yep. How can we elevate that to where they're there? They're, gosh, you know, I'm glad I'm going back to the dealership. All right, so, so now let me ask you this question. So now let's go back to the, the, the one with the cattle in the field. Okay. You found six times. You've asked better questions. Yeah. You came up with solutions and answers that got you five to six times yeah. Uh, yeah. revenue or profit, yeah. revenue, right? Yeah. Revenue. Mm-hmm. What's the next question for that one now that you've done that? How do we build a sales channel? Okay. Yeah. And I told our guys, my general manager is still with me today, 14 years. I, I said, look, the hardest thing we're going to do is build a sales channel. He said, harder than what we just did? I said, harder than what we just did. <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. If, if you pick the right stuff to work on, the world will find you. And that's what happened. I, now, that might not always be the case, but I can see multiple times for me, and I can see multiple times for people I know in the space, these different industries, where they did the right thing at the right time. And, Scott, I want to tell you something. The BDC, when, when, when I started that in 1991, um, the timing was perfect. It was perfect. Yeah. There was a lot of focus on the showroom experience and the changing, like I was giving you the metrics for what's going on and buying cycles getting longer and you can't, you can't desk deals like this. It's not acceptable. Dealer satisfaction scores were big. CSI was born. You know, there's a lot of that was going on, right? right? Okay. Steve Jobs created the smartphone. That He created the cell phone. And had you started that smartphone, I should say, back in 1980, Things wouldn't have turned out real well, buddy, because there was no internet. <laughs> it was too early. Yeah. So I, I would just say that sometimes you have the right idea, but the timing may be an issue. So, you know, again, the questions are the key. Um, some other questions I'd love to ask on potential. You know, I, I, I'd love to look at things and say, okay, uh, if we could accomplish, uh, if we could double our revenue, in the next 90 days, what are three things you would say we'd have to do? What are one or two things we, we would have to do? If we, if we could grow um, 50% in the next year, what are two things you would need to have in place in order to do that? Well, gosh, as soon as you start asking these questions, I'm not telling you you'll have the answer, but your brain will go to work. And we underestimate that guy. I mean, the answers are sitting there waiting for you. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. You just gave us a few more quick questions. In the, in the process. That's outstanding. I have sheets of these. So I, I'm a big thing on, I, I'm big on questions as well. I love it. We were touring your office. Mm-hmm. And so where do your innovative ideas come from? Mm-hmm. Because you've got, whether it's how you train, yeah. but also just the, I, to me, it's very innovative uh, in terms of just how you've set up this entire office it's well thought out in terms of the experience of the people you're training, the people that are doing the training. So you've set up an environment that really helps people learn. Um, where do you get all these ideas? Well, first of all, from some mistakes that have been made, I, yeah. I've made my share. And so you can't be afraid to make a few mistakes. Yeah. I mean, you, you want to be intelligent and measure those mistakes, but you got to, you got to get feedback. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think I've always started uh, at the end and worked my way back. So I kind of have a picture of, okay, what are we trying, what's, what are we trying to make happen here? Yep. You know, what's the change? Another we're good to question. Make? Yes. <laughs> and then say, okay, what are some ways to do it? What are the pieces? I think the mistake sometimes made in creating change, Scott, is we try and rabbit hole our way from where we are to there. And, and it's easier to start at the end and back your way up. Does that make sense? It, it makes, so... We're in marketing, yeah, right? Yeah. And I always, I am a, a just a huge believer in working your way backwards from the sales side back to the marketing. Typically, when you start from the marketing side and work your way to sales, the sales team fights you. Um, but when you True. start with sales and work your way back to the marketing, uh, the process and just the entire campaign works much better. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, what do they say? Jeff Bezos said, you know, we start with the customer and work our way back. Yeah. Steve Jobs. Yeah. You asked about the book in the library. Yes. You know, you start with the customer and work your way back. 
I mean, honestly, it's not like these guys made this stuff up. It's obvious. It's obvious. If you start there, that's why I have questions for each business so that everybody understands. Like next week, we have a new marketing guy. The guy's incredibly talented. I hope, we, I hope he's here a long time. Yep. The guy's hair's on fire. I mean, this guy's, okay. So the challenge for me with this guy coming in is how do I get to the bottom line really quick? Not a bunch of drivel, not 42 PowerPoint decks. How do I get there in one question? Yeah. Where like lasered, he understands that, by the way, he's going to straddle two companies. Yeah. It's going to come through a question, man. He's going to understand what are we trying to impact here? And then every conversation we have from that point on is going to vector off of, oh, I see why texting and mobile payments are important. Yep. Because that ties to the customer experience and service. That's why he's, oh, I see why they do want to do the outbound campaigns that way. So what we really should show dealers is this. Got it? As opposed to he's in some box going, okay, how do I market my way up? Like you just said. Right. Bro, that's a crap. That's Vegas. That's right. Those are long odds. Yeah. Not a lot of people win there. No. No. Yeah. I don't. Well, that's what they tell me. <laughs> I, I, I try. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. So... So I want to know at the deep root level, why is it so important to you? Yeah. Okay. If I say Ford, General Motors, GE, I mean, those are companies you recognize, yeah. right? Um, I love watching the Fortune 500 list. I just love it. It's like, it's like watching, you know, your favorite sports team, whatever, right? And in 2011, all those guys were on that list. Yep. All of them were there. They were top 10. They were top 10. In 2020, how many of them do you think were in the top 10? Probably none. Zero. Yeah. Zero. In fact, of the top 10, how many do you think were still in the top 10 from 2011, that's not that long ago, no. to 2020? Just guess. doesn't matter. You could be 100% wrong. Over the nine-year period instead of just today? 2011 to 2020, 10 were here. How many of those 10 were still there? Were any of them still there? Were all of them still there? Uh, or my guess would be two or three. There were two, right. brother. You nailed it. And I'll tell you who they were. One was Walmart. Yeah. And one was Berkshire. Yeah. And the other eight were out. So here's the question. The question is, did they all make the same mistake? Or was there something going on on the sideline with their competition? Was somebody staying up all night? innovating what they were already doing, finding a way to do it faster, cheaper, better. Look, if you're going to build a business, there's three things you're trying to do. Number one, simple, find a problem. Number two, fix the problem. Number three, scale it. Yep. Okay. So who's knocking on the door of Walmart, brother? Amazon. Yeah. Amazon. They're well, now, right. Now you've got Walmart trying to respond to that uh, and answer back. Hey, in a, in a different way, but a lot of times that's too li too little, too late. I love that you said that. You just you put the ball on the tee for me. And it's like a beach ball. Look, <laughs> they took fifteen years yeah. to model the the pickup and deliver, and uh, fifteen years. Yeah. Okay, fifteen days, fifteen weeks, fifteen months. I'm probably having a coronary heart attack. Fifteen years. Yeah. Do you guys even want to compete? Yeah. Right. So you gotta. So so why is it so important? Because. The answer is simple. Business demands innovation. So the game is actually find, fix, scale, do it faster, better, cheaper. And you say, well, John, I can't do it. Okay, which ones can you do? Can you do it faster? Well, that might be a solution. Here, when Bezos, let's look at what they did at Amazon. So when we, you know, it was a grocery store in the cloud. I remember my wife buying stuff from Amazon early on, like 2001. And I was like, okay, so this is just books and music. And she's like, yeah, I said, oh, they'll never make it. That's what I said. I said, oh, they'll never make it. Yeah, well, I didn't realize that little loop, and I don't know if the loop was there, but A to Z, yeah. that little loop, that's A to Z. Yeah. We're going to sell it all. We're going to buy Whole Foods. You <laughs> can get groceries. That's why it's there. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's not oh, a smiley face. Yeah, <laughs> so I told you I don't always ask the right question the first time, right? Yeah. Is that all they're going to sell? Yeah. Well, see, okay. So I guess my point is, is that um, – you could get it in two days. And I thought that was crazy. Then you could get it next day. And I was like, oh, that's ridiculous. And then you saw same. Amazon Locker and you saw same day. And so I'll tell you what I said. I'm like, really? Like, what is it that I actually have to have today that I'm or that I have to have today? Everything. Very little. Very little. But you know what he did? 
uh, Buffett says this really well. Everybody wants it today, though. Well, now they do. He yeah. shifted. But Warren says, when you build a business, build it with a moat around it, right? Build it with a moat, alligators in water. Protect that business. So think about what Jeff did. He took that business and he said, okay, next day is good, but same day is better. Because if you and I decide we want to back up truckloads of money and compete with Amazon, you understand we have to build all these distribution centers in all these cities around the world. Yeah. We have to put together all this workforce. We have to develop this culture to sell the same toothbrush or bottle of water. Scott, you and I are going to go, let's pick a, better, let's pick a different problem. Yeah. Because somebody's already there. They're so far down the road. So what they've done is they keep asking the right questions. Cheaper, better, Thanks. faster. Yeah. And sometimes they can only answer one, but they're moving the ball. Does that make sense? Correct. They're moving the ball each time. They've made it so easy to buy that it's hard not to. I, they've, they have really done a good job of, I guess, conditioning all of us, you, me, yeah. everybody listening, in the sense that now if I want to go research a car, I want to go research a hotel, I get very frustrated when I go to a hotel site and I can't quickly just – I want to see what the room looks like. I want to see where the reviews are. I want to get a feel. Are and you when, a Yelp guy too? Uh, I don't use a lot of Yelp. Okay. But when I can't just go quickly and see and get the information, because with Amazon, that's what I'm accustomed to. Right. And so if I want to buy something online, I compare things. So a lot of people, a lot of businesses make the mistake of judging their performance or efficiencies based on their own comp their direct competitors. Whereas not every customer is measuring you against that. When I go to a hotel, when I go for any type of, uh, if I get a customer service issue, I compare them to some of the hotels I stay in. I compare them to American Express, things that I, where I experience tremendous customer support, right? And I hold every business I do to that standard. Yeah. I just had a rental car, all right? And, uh, you know, I'm at a level to where it's supposed to pick me up at the curb of the airport. I don't have to get with the buses and, and all that. Now, with COVID, I had I had to go right. to the thing. But I'm still not supposed to have to go to the counter, all right? And sure enough, my name's not on the board. It's the only reason I'm part of the program, <laughs> right? So I'm measuring this, yes. and I'm saying this would never happen with this company. This would never happen. I'm not measuring against other rental car agencies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of business leaders that by not asking the right questions, they get so focused and tunnel visioned in what they do each and every day. And I think they lose sight of the opportunities. So your audience that's listening, if they're trying to sum up what you just said, because that was a nugget, that was a really good nugget. I think in a word, it's perception. So customer experience is perception it's that, like you were perceiving do i matter yeah based on whether your name was on the board yes or no correct yeah it wasn't how friendly were they but it was this perception of do i still matter so if you want to know I, I reacted very well i'm trying to be a better human. i know you did I'm trying you're to be a class. better human <laughs> your first class here's the thing though if th these the folks watching are trying to figure out okay how do we win at the cx game how do we win as we innovate that process? Because that's your differentiator, right? Yep. And so the answer is you already, you can already, you know, based on the perception the customer has, all you gotta do is look, listen, touch, right? I think um, Bezos has another one. He says, he says, every day is day one. Have you ever heard that? I have not heard that one. All right. And I like his quotes. Every day is day one. So, uh, you know, in every meeting at Amazon, there's always an empty chair. So what does that empty chair resemble? That resembles the customer who's not here, who we're representing today. So that's a thing. And it's all it is, is just us saying, look, this is about you. What we're building here is it's about you. And so it starts there and it reminds everybody in the room, hey, look, this isn't about us. Like we have a saying here, that thing in the middle, that organism that we call company, that's the bread we're all eating. It's not about you, Scott. It's right. not about me, John. It doesn't matter what my title is. It's about that. And if we grow and tend to that, there'll be enough bread here for everybody. So it starts with that chair, okay? Yep. And then every day is day one. 1991. We both started our companies in 91, buddy. Yeah. Do you remember day one? 
Oh, I remember it well. I was scared to death. Looking back, I was almost screaming to myself, seeing myself on the movie screen, like, don't do it, you know. But the energy that we had in the beginning, how many day ones have we had since? We probably had a lot. A lot of them. Right? And so, to me, innovation also, brother, is a piece of just every day is day one. And so, when your team begins to realize that they have the freedom to think that way, you know, that they have the freedom to introduce the questions. Hey, what if? Hey, could we? Hey, what would it take if we were to blank? You follow me? Yep. I mean, then all of a sudden you're growing in all parts of your body. I mean, it's it's exciting. So um, I've got a question. So you had brought up, you just hired a new marketing manager. Mm -hmm. Director. Yeah. So, so this big responsibilities. When you have people, and I think this goes to the heart of innovation, you were just now touching on it. When you go... When you have these people coming in and they're starting to come up with what type of culture do you have or how do you create the type of culture where it really allows people to come to you with because we can't think of all of them and quite honestly if we're thinking of all the ideas we're in deep you know mm -hmm. we're deep shit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we are yeah so how do you create the type of culture that really nurtures that and allows people to grow and, and yeah I think, first of all, listen is the first thing that comes to mind. Well, I noticed out there you've got your suggestion box for one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Mm -hmm. So is that just for inner office stuff or is that for even product stuff? Anything. Okay. Anything. And we empty it every day. All right. So that's, you know, it's like we, we agreed in terms. So, okay, if we're going to do that, we're going to empty the laundry basket every day. Yeah. And we're going to address those people back and thank them, yep. ask questions. So you might not have the best idea. You might have the, the play that changes the game idea. But the bottom line is you, you have to start, I think, by letting everybody know they're heard. Yep. One of the things I've done under COVID with all of my managers, directors, and C-level people, so we're talking 30 people, is I have a blind copy list, okay? And I send out one question, and it's about every four to six days. And I actually have 14 questions I want to ask them. And I'm on question five. And so some people take longer to answer these questions. So one of them is like, what is the one key thing you use to measure our success? And I have, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I'm very interested in where they're at. I'm very interested in finding a stone unturned. But what I've also learned by asking questions like that is they appreciate the fact that the organization wants to know yeah. and that they're heard. Now, I will tell you the answer to that question, I've gotten retention of clients, retention of employees, uh, revenue, you know, all, all things that are, okay, they're reasonable. They're yeah. good answers. But at the end of the day, my message to them going back when we're together in our team call is this. It's two words, overwhelming value. Let me tell you why. Because... In what we do at Traver Connect, in this case, if we deliver overwhelming value to that customer, okay, first of all, we, get, we all get to define what's included in overwhelming value. And as you mentioned earlier, perception. Listen, what we think is valuable is irrelevant. What the marketplace, they've got the vote, and they vote with their time, effort, and their money. And so it is about perception of value. So it's important to listen to that. But go ahead. I, I heard that and heard Makes what sense. you said earlier. And I was like, it's the same thing. Value is a good word. But when you add overwhelming yeah. to it, now it's a bulldozer. Correct. Like it's a machine. Yep. Like you picture something massive. <clears throat> so like to me, communication is a contact sport. Okay. And so you can, I always taught in keywords and phrases, never scripts. Yep. Because I want you to be you. Yep. So I want to show you a couple key questions you want to ask. Where to ask them, where to avoid them what to be listening for, okay, to help just sort of get you comfortable with where this goes. But I want you to be you, all right? So in order to make connection, I'm asking them. I'm learning what their perception is, right? Yep. And, and then, of course, I can unify us with some answers. So to me, I think you got to do that. The second thing is, in terms of your question is, uh, you have to doubt your own infallibility, Scott. Um, here's the thing. I, you know, there's some guys I know that are, they're fun to be around. You know, they're full of braggadocia. I mean, you know, they won every game they ever played, you know, like that, right? 
And it's like, bro, you didn't really win every game you ever played. I can, you could check the tape, right? Like couples <laughs> retreat. We want to check the tape, right? So uh, Jason Favreau or whatever. That's great. Is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so it's like, you have to doubt your infallibility. And let me tell you why. In business, for me, <clears throat> look up the definition of infallibility. It literally means, you ready? To not be wrong. Well, how in the heck could I never be wrong? First of all, if you're never wrong, Gene Lamont, who coached the White Sox for years, was a third base coach for the Astros. And my kids, we played a lot of baseball. My kids are coming up. Gene Lamont was a third base coach. And I swear to you, Scott, he had one move. It was this. He stopped everybody. Yep. And I, was, I told my kids, and we had some little league teams and stuff there with us. And I said, look, guys, here's the thing. That's okay to a point. His job is to roll the dice. If everybody gets thrown out, he's not good at his job. If nobody ever gets thrown out, he's not good at his job. <laughs> That's right. Because his job is to eke that extra run. It could be the difference in the game. That's right. His job is to line it up, know the player. So I guess my point is, you know, you can never be infallible. And I think that's what makes great companies great. You know, that's what makes an Amazon great. That's why they go from two day to one day to same day. Yeah. Because he's like, well, shoot, it's not good enough. Well, it was. But now he's built a moat that's so stinking deep and wide and filled with alligators and snakes. I don't know who's going to compete with that. Well, he says they'll be bankrupt. Well, maybe. Maybe. So the, all the big ones eventually, uh, it doesn't mean they go bankrupt, but it, all the big ones at some point change. But if he continues to ask the right questions, let me ask you this. Is there a difference between invention and innovation? Yeah, definitely. I, I love your question because it separates the two. So, um, you know how we talked a little bit about our upbringing earlier when we got started and, you know, when I was going to school, working in a dealership, all that. But after that, I still have subscribed heavily to training and education. I, I love to learn and I know you do too. I was, I was blown away by your, one of your training rooms in there, your approach to training on software, which if we've, any of the business leaders listen, you know, we all know that that is not an easy thing yeah. you get to get buy in it's more importantly to get it the software you're training on is is salespeople using this so if they don't know it know how to use it no it's going to impact sales at a deep level this isn't just someone doing a data entry thing and and so um the approach to that when salespeople don't fully understand it is what they're doing what they're selling or don't feel comfortable they just don't do it Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it, it's a huge but what you're go ahead let me I interrupted your, your answer there and I apologize that's but, okay but well, I, when you said that I just go back to that tour uh, and what I saw in there and that was our customer uh, computer based training center CBT yeah. we call it uh, it seats 12 people uh, why doesn't it seat 15 or 20 because when you start getting that big you lose the, the actual training slows down because it's like a kindergarten class of 30 kids there, there's a dexterity going on in that training where you have to have everybody that has temple. And so 12 is it. Um, we have interactive screens, so we can go to your screen right now and have you input customer. It's on the TVs and everybody can see. And we're creating a little bit of pressure because we want to sort of duplicate, replicate that. Um, there's reasons why we do it. Again, do we do that day one? No. But if every day is day one, ah, yeah. then we're starting to find, oh, hey, let's shrink the group. Hey, let's electronic TVs. Hey, two screens. Hey, let's role play. And you just keep getting better. If we get just this much better every day, right. where are we in 365? So your question really is invention versus innovation. So here, this is where I would go. What Scott did is he split this into two distinct roles. So Bob Beal, B-O-B-B-B-I-E-H-L. I had the pleasure of meeting Bob uh, years ago, and he's become a mentor and a personal friend. Bob sat on the board of directors with Focus on the Family, James Dobson, for 31 years. Mm -hmm. Bob worked with Peter Drucker. Okay. Yep. I mean, he's worked with thousands of leaders around the world. Yep. Bob is super sharp. And I call Bob a, I tell him, I say, you're a conceptualist. Like, you can take and look at stuff and you just whoosh, and do that. Uh, the Republican Party called him um, and said, you know, how are we going to win in 2016 they called Beal. Wow. Yes. Liz Dole. So, I mean, it's just, it's wild to see some of the stuff Bob did. So one of the things you ask invention versus innovation, right? Yep. 
So I want to introduce you to three words that Bob taught me. I want to give I always want to give credit where credit's due. So I have to remember. I don't have to write these down. I have it on. The yeah, page. you can actually go back to the recording. <laughs> so so if you picture a front porch, uh, I'm going to give you five columns, but I'm going to give you the first three. Okay. So the first word is design. The second word is develop, and the third word is stabilize. What those words represent is the roles of the people you and I work alongside, our coworkers in business, whether they're in our companies or they're our clients or they're, you know, the other vendors, but you have design, develop, stabilize. And then, so in between design, develop, stabilize, you have a designer developer and you have a developer stabilizer. Now let me explain. A designer is somebody who creates stuff out of thin air, brother. Okay, let me help you. Steve Jobs. Yep. Elon Musk. Okay. And what they're really good at is abstract thinking. So like they can just, what the world needs is this. Okay. So that's their strength. Their weakness is sometimes their ideas are so abstract. It's like the Chia pet. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, uh, bro, I'm not sure. You know, like Mars. It's hard to get. SpaceX. Okay, we're going to take you to Mars. I don't know if anybody's read the fine print, but they don't bring you back. Okay? <laughs> you just live in Mars. That's it. So, Sayonara, you better take the whole clan. All right? So, that's a true story. So, um, so my point is designers are very important. So, you say invent or innovate. Well, who do you think does the inventing? Designers. So, if your job is to invent something, you don't have a designer in the house, bro, you're just talking to yourself. Okay, yeah. so you need that mindset and you want to learn to recognize what that is. Okay, a developer is somebody who takes an existing idea at some level and they improve it. They improve it. A designer developer has kind of a foot in each of those buckets. That's kind of how I'm wired. I'm a design develop guy. I think you are too. Yeah. You, creative and marketing. But you also look for ideas that already exist and you're running with it just by the questions you ask. Yeah. That's, okay, now why is that a really good profile? Let me tell you something. It is a profile. Yes, it's useful. But the most useful part is know what your strength is because if once you know that, you know how to take and make something last. Watch this. You know that third leg over there that nobody really wants to talk about, stabilize? You know what your and my ideas are worth without a stabilizer? Nothing. You, you know how long they last? They're vapor. So to me, when, when we're building stuff, I have people on staff that are purely stabilizers. Yeah. My CFO is as hardcore of a stabilizer as there is. Yeah. There might be a little develop in him, but look, brother, what I want is consistency there. Yeah. Right? And accuracy. Okay. So, so to me, they all play a key, a key role. Um, and so you go invention versus innovation. The answer is once you understand design, develop, stabilize, and the couple that split design, develop, and develop, stabilize – you can build out a team. And then once you do, what you want to do is you want to listen to your team that you're talking to and begin, like I actually have a set of questions that yep. I could give you that yep. you could ask and it'll tell you, look, this person, now does that not mean that I cannot stabilize? If I see you on the roadside in a car accident, can I do first aid? Bro, definitely. But here's the thing. So what level? What, what level of what? First aid? <laughs> so, uh, if, I, if I'm on the road, all right, I'm on the road, I'm lying there. And I got to rely on you. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't feel that confident. <laughs> you should. You should. Well, I have some years in Boy Scouts. I mean, I know my way around the first aid kit, and I have a cell phone I can call for help. You know, so I'm the, that's going to be my question. Yes. Do you have a cell phone? Yes. Do you have a cell phone? I, I, he, he reads me well. You know, the the, the thing is, is that um, you know, as as we look at this, we need a balanced attack and. Um, Honestly, if you can find your sweet spot and work from there, that's where your best stuff's going to come from. So if I'm asking my stabilizer to be a creator and I go, hey, how come you don't ever change? Okay, John, he doesn't change because it's not his natural strength. Yeah. So to me, innovation and invention, you need to understand what goes into creating that. It's a mindset. It's a makeup. Kids that are natural innovators, adults that are natural innovators, I'm sorry, inventors, yep. they probably, if you look back to their fourth grade era, you, you're going to learn a lot about why they think the way they think. I'm glad you answered that question well because I think a lot of people think when they hear the word inno innovate, they think it requires an invention of something. 
But it isn't that. Mm -mm. It's an existing idea that you're going to improve. Yeah. And uh, I like I like it like this. If I said, look, um, hey Scott, I want to get in the McDonald's business in Dallas. We got some money set aside. I'd like you to go pick out five locations, get the buildings built, find the contractors, put the teams in, make them profitable. Okay. If I say, hey Scott, I got five we just bought. Two are super underperforming, like car business, right? Yep. Um, can you come in and improve them? Hey Scott, I got five. They're all home runs. They all do really well. Just don't screw it up. Yep. There it is. There's design, develop, stabilize. Yep. You have to know what stage you're at in that game. And everybody can contribute somewhere, but you need to have all three bases covered. So you were able to start a lot of very successful businesses. You bought, you, have you bought some or just mm -hmm. started them? Mm -hmm. So you bought and sold. I know mm -hmm. you've sold some. Mm -hmm. um, more importantly, in extremely competitive verticals. Mm -hmm. What is the most important, all the business leaders that are listening, what's the most important thing they could do to generate more creative thinking when it comes to disruptive innovation? Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Drucker had a great quote. When the facts are clear, the decisions jump out at you. Have you ever heard that one? I have not, and I follow, I, I know a lot of his. When the facts are clear. So um, Bob Beal taught me something. But I just want to say this first. You got to get the facts, Scott. Yep. There's, there's in every business we have to do this. Um, opinions are fine, okay. Yep. Uh, but they're not always the facts. No. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. So for me personally, I, I brutal truth. Yep. You know, the, how how good are we? How bad are we? Not, you know. But but I think I think it starts there. Um, when you when you get into um, what really is true today in businesses, you have to know your numbers. Yep. Um, so earlier you caught that. And I think in each business, there's two or three denominators that I look at. Um, it's not just what I hear or see. It's what I don't hear or see that tells me where we're at. Yeah. And, and so I learned that over time, that it's, it's the things I'm not hearing. I know there's a void. There's a chasm. Um, Stephen Covey Years ago, you know, first things first um, and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People was the, the, the first book. But I remember a workshop he did in Houston, 2,500 people at the hotel there by the Astrodome. And uh, we come back from a break and he's got this table and it had this glass like vase on it. And it was filled with river rock, Colorado river rock, yeah. our kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, he's bald and he's sweet voice and he's talking. He's like, hey, do you think this thing's full? You know, and everybody's like, well, yeah, it's full. You know, and he, like this. And he reaches under the table. It's got an apron. And he pulls out this steel pail and you can't see what's in it. And he pours it over the vase and it's gravel. And we're all kind of groaning, you know, and he's like shaking it over the river rock and it's sifting so its think, way down. Right. And he goes, do you think it's full now? You know, and now there's like some doubters in the audience and he nods. He reaches again. And we all chuckle. Twenty five hundred people. And he goes up above. It's sand. Yeah. And the sand goes over the gravel, over the river. Rock, and it happens a, a fourth time. He goes down or a third time, whatever it was. And it's another bucket and it's water. And the water goes to the sand, the gravel and the river. And he says, you know, it's interesting about that. If you start with the water. Nothing fits. If you start with the gravel, I promise you, nothing. If you start with the sand, nothing. He said, the way you do things and the order you do things is really important. So um, to me, it's about the numbers, the right numbers. When you and I got in this business, somebody told us the same thing, and we started in two different states. They told us both it's a numbers game. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And is it still a numbers game? I, I would submit to your audience, it is still a numbers game. The thing is, the numbers do evolve. So the key is, do you get paradigm paralysis? Do you, you know, the closing rate is 30% and fresh ups. Well, hey, look, brother, it's not, okay? <laughs> more cars, more vehicles, more money, uh, more educated equals a longer buying cycle. Our closing percentage is shorter. I used to say, you don't get awards for closing percentage. Yeah. You only get rewarded for deliveries. So if I were you, I wouldn't penalize salespeople for logging ups they didn't close. I would give them protection. So long as they reach out once every week and we have a documentation of that, they're going to be protected. They're always going to get half that deal. That customer comes back and buys. Scott, you're getting paid on half so long as you show me continual follow-up through our system. But you got to log it the first time. 
So it's like shifting the way I've learned to work. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. You know, we've got COVID going on and it's, re it's put a lot of pressure on dealers and all businesses, not just dealers, in terms of they're, they're looking at their sales models, how they handle things. A lot of things are shifting to even more online. And I feel like, you know, we both have a foot in the door on auto, obviously, right? Yeah. And so uh, I think there's been a lot of dealers that may have oh, resist that movement. May not be the right word, but maybe want to keep one foot here and one foot uh, you, one foot in the into that process and one foot out because they still want to protect some old ways of doing things. And that might vary based on geography and, and where these dealers are located. But what COVID did and what I recognized, and I think brings something, something to the heart of what you're doing, and that is it really put a spotlight on the BDC. And so I was talking to you as we toured uh, Adam Aaron, who we've had on the show, great operator. Mm -hmm. He does a great job of knowing his numbers. And one of the numbers he looks at is, here I have my sales team. And they were doing things the traditional way. And then I had, I've got this internet thing that, that comes out here. And now I've got to handle all these people that are shopping online. And let me add this BDC team. Well, he, he sold more cars. But his, he's basically, for easy math, we'll say doubled the size of his sales force. Where he didn't double sales. So his sold units per sales team member isn't where he is. So what he does now is he measures it as one team. Okay. All right. Okay. And he sits there and says, I want 20 cars per person that I have on my sales team. Because what he doesn't want to do is he wants, doesn't want to, he wants to avoid getting fat again in the sense that I'm just adding people to a problem here instead of looking at and asking better questions. And now he's asking better questions, right? And, and so his goals are constantly improve his average per total team mm -hmm. not this guy sold 20 cars and my bdc's handling this many calls what kind of shift whether it's just auto or even out any industry what shifts are you seeing on this because i would assume uh, especially on high ticket items that people still have some questions there are still some things that they they at some point there's going to be some uh, human interaction on this right it's not a hundred percent out there, but I know we we like to envision and in Carvanas of the world out there, and we can buy online. But there is still inner human interaction at some point in that deal. Mm -hmm. How has all this evolved? What changes have you seen? How? What type of questions are you asking yourself? You know, these are the questions that are coming to me mm -hmm. as we're going through this time period. Mm -hmm. So, anytime there's a lot of change going on around us in any space in any industry. Uh, you want to get your bearings. Yep. So there's, a, there's an interception on the field. And so now the direction of the ball just changed. And you want to have your head on a swivel, you got, might get it knocked off, right? So to me, when things change in business, you want to get your bearings. And the easiest way to do that is going to be with a question. Yep. And the question is, what's the good business reason for doing this? Don't be me too. It's not a Nike world. You know, just do it. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes perfect it's sense. It's not, man. It is. Look, I, I've watched certain companies. Like I remember a bank, and it's not necessarily a great one. At the time, they were great. They were bought by Wells Fargo. <clears throat> but they were slow to the ATM space. And these guys, their return on was, was incredible. It was like 5X of what the banking industry returned, publicly traded stock. Um, but they always challenged everything with what's the good business reason, WTGBR. Yeah, what's the good business yeah. reason for doing this? So to me, I think that slows us down. It gets us to listen. It gets us to ask the right questions. A lot of these answers, honestly, are sitting right there. I mean, you, they're available to you. You just have to WTGBR and say, okay, now, so with BDC, he started, right? And then he's like, wait a minute, what's the good business? So he's trying to manage his expense to sales ratio, yeah. right? Also this. <clears throat> well, you know, what, he's, what he's found, all right, when he had to go through either a furlough or, or situation like that is his better people, all right? And, and I've talked to multiple dealers where 
even as they've because having a skeleton crew is not sustainable they people can't yeah. work like that forever yeah. but as they kind of built back up they're not building back up to the same level that they were before correct they're also finding that the more people they can get to talk to quite honestly people that for them deliver better results mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. So it, it, they're just much better off. Mm -hmm. No, you're, which is the answer to one of your questions. Yes, you just said. <laughs> yes. You know, I, we were in Jackson Hole. I think when you and I were talking this summer, yeah. something like that. And my wife and I got away just for a few days, and we love going there, like you yeah. and your bride do. Yeah. And it was a little different under COVID, but it was yeah. still Jackson Hole. It was still awesome. So if you haven't been there, put it on your bucket list. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful country. Um, so we we had never done the galleries before. We we're doing a little bit of change in the house and. Um, and so we want some photography that are, you know, pa not paintings, but actual photography for a certain part of the house. And uh, so we're in this gallery and we meet this guy, Ronnie, sweet guy. And we end up getting some things from Ronnie. And it, towards the tail end, he said to me, he said, hey, he said, are you a good receiver? Because I had said something about some, there was an antler shed that I thought would look really cool somewhere in the house. And he goes, are you a good receiver? And I was like, I've never heard that before. And, I, and he goes, a good receiver. Do you receive well? Well, then I understood what he meant. And I said, I, I think so. <laughs> and he said, well, I want you to have it. And so that got me to think of what you just said. So, you know, we talk about what's the good business reason for doing this. And so we start asking these questions to our teams, to our staff. Yeah. The question is, are you guys good receivers? Hmm. Like, am I a good receiver? Do we listen well? To where the answer that's sitting right there on the table, we go, you know what? We need to test that. We need to kind of pick that. We need to, we need to scrub that and see how far that could take us. Because that may be. And we have a saying here, best idea wins. We always say best idea wins. It's not John's idea. It's not Scott's idea. It's not Bob's idea, Rob's idea, Hisham's idea. It's not how it works. The best idea wins. Always. And we're all cool with that because we're focused on what's in the middle of the table. The organism that's feeding us all, covering us all, that's why we do what we do. Yep. Yeah. I mean, so I, to me, I would be shocked if there is not a, a business leader out there that at some point has tried and said, you know what? We need to be more innovative. Starting today, we're going to be more innovative, right? And then they throw some things out there and... Are there things that, whether it's resources, websites, it, tools, is there anything that you kind of lean on a little bit that would help these people make this a little easier? Mm. So I suggest people read, first of all, yep. read, read the right stuff. You know, um, <clears throat> you can experience somebody else's experience by just reading. You might not have enough time in your life to experience everything that's been experienced but you can virtually experience it. So I read the right stuff. Warren Buffett, I, I forget the number of books he reads, yeah. but I remember when I heard the number, yeah. and, I, and it might be per week. Yeah, it is. It, it's, it is. I don't even know how that's possible. Well, you know what? There's probably <laughs> 20 minutes of sleep you don't need. Get up a little earlier. Read before you go to bed, whatever. If you want it, you can get it. That's right. Okay. You know, so, so I think the second is engage. Um, you got to engage with the right thought leader. So what's your circle look like? Like some guys, some gals are still running with high school friends and that may be great. You may be the most fortunate person in the world, but to me, it's like, you're always sort of what I learned in the cattle business is there's thing, a term called culling, C-U-L-L-I-N-G. And the first term, first time I ever heard it, I, I wasn't really sure what I was hearing. And, uh, I learned. And, and of course, what it means is you have like a female cow who doesn't get pregnant and you're trying to manage a group, hundreds of cattle and you have like 20% that don't get pregnant when they're supposed to. It's not like you're breeding them all year long. You breed, so then you manage all the calves at the same time. It's a management overhead cost, right? Yep. So the ones that don't, they don't get pregnant, you call because they're not productive. Um, now, that may seem a little harsh, so it's not like get rid of your friend because they don't give you something. I think there's three types of friends, too. I think Chuck Swindoll taught me this years ago um, through one of his deals, but... You know, I think there's friends that you have that you get something Who, from. What was his name? Chuck Swindoll. Oh, Swindoll. Okay. Yes. I wanted to say, I, yes. I misheard that. Yes. I wanted, it's not yes. Mike Lindell. No, no. And it's, and it's not uh, Greg Swindell okay. either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Chuck said there's three types of friends. He said, you know, there's the ones that you get something from, but like you can never give something back to. There's ones that are the opposite. You give, give, give. And like they never ask how you're doing. 
Right. Right. And then there's ones where it's like every time you talk, you just pour into one another. And he said, here's the thing. You need all three. Yeah. And so my point is you're not really getting rid of people. But the question is when you engage the right audience, you know, uh, that's key. Now, if you have the right audience, they're probably going to give you feedback. And so you may say to me, hey, John, just being real, one of the things you really need to look at is this area here. Because it looks like that's a huge hole for you guys, you know. And, and so I got to be willing to accept, right, yeah. and do something about it. And so if you got those three, if you read, if you engage with the right group, and if you're teachable, I would just say you're dangerous. Yeah. Like I don't want to compete against that guy. Yeah. Because that guy, that gal, they got all three going on. Yeah. That to me is impressive. And so that's what we should all strive for. If and going back to the thing I was saying, you know, here I am, I'm a business leader. I'm committed, right? I, I, I want more in I want to be more innovative. But the reality is, you know what, I've I've made that decision. I've had meetings about it and we're gonna do some things and Nothing changes, right? And by the way, I want to be very clear. That's not my business. <laughs> so, but for the business leaders out there who've had have, that experience, right? I'll have what he's having. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you get them unstuck? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Beal had a three B. He yeah. had three Fs and I added a fourth. I'm going to give it to you. All right. So you're stuck, right? Yeah. You're, just, you're in that place and it's just like, dang it. You know, here we are again. It's Humpty Dumpty, off the wall again, yep. all that, right? So I think number one is fear. There's the first F. You can't be afraid to fail. So like there's things we'll do here where like I know it's risky, but here's the bottom line. We're not going to be the team that said, well, I don't know, we never tried it. You, so fear is, it can't be a thing. It's got to be intelligent risk, but you got to be. Some of us fail and we're stuck because we won't try. Right. We're like, no, that's going to cost too much. How do you know? That's you right. haven't done it. <laughs> you're, you're sitting there in a chair telling me, but you haven't actually done it. Write the check. Do it. So that's one F. Two is fatigue. Some are just pooped. Yeah. Tell me I'm wrong. No. You're okay. Hard, you're what did Lombardi yeah. say? I'm a hard, hardcore Green Bay Packer fan. Love me or hate me. <laughs> um, so those from Chicago, sorry. But uh, Lombardi said, fear makes cowards of us all. Yeah. Okay, and so what it does is it wears you out to the point where you're like, I, 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 I just can't get myself up for that. Okay, so so you got fear, you got fatigue. The third is fog. So let's say you and I win a trip to uh, the autobahn. We get the car of our dreams is waiting. You, you're probably running a Testarossa or something, right? <laughs> and I mean, we're 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 talking about this for months before we get on the flight and we go there. We fly in that night. We get up the next morning and it's like we're getting ready. They're going to take us to the Autobahn and we get to drive full on for a day and it's all paid. We, it seems like it's still night. The fog is so heavy that we can barely see. Yeah. And you and I instantly know we're not going anywhere today. Yeah. Sometimes you can't drive fast in the fog, can you? And so some guys are stuck. Some gals are stuck because they can't see very far. So you go, well, how do I clear the fog? Remember when the facts are clear? Okay, so you got to get back to the facts. So to me, you got to have, in order to have that Autobahn experience where you can really move forward and you're stuck, sometimes it's fog. You're not clear. It might be the priorities piece I gave you on Covey. You know, it's, Scott, it's, it, you're, you're either stuck with fear, fatigue, fog, or the fourth one, flirtations. And flirtations to me is not flirting with the, a member of the opposite sex, although it could be, but what it really is, is it's like, bro, why are you horsing around with all this other stuff? In our stuff? single days, that was the funnest form of it. Well, okay. And you heard it here. It, is your wife? She's with me on this trip. Okay, great. I, yes. Okay. I said yeah. in our my you did. He days. did say single days. He did say, well, that's the time. That's, that's yeah. yeah. So, you know, the thing is, is that flirtations take you off task. Yeah. And so some of us, the bottom line is, we just, we're not really focused. And, you know, for a lot of innovative people, that can be a challenge. Because it's easy to see something, an idea, or the way you were treated somewhere that you like, man, we could incorporate that here. Yeah. Or it's hard, it's easy to get pulled in different directions. Yeah. So I'm going to be the first to raise my hand and tell you, I've committed that many times. Yeah. All four of those. I've committed all four of those. Same here. And so what helps me, though, is to see them on my mental board and go, okay, where am I right now? I know it's one of the F's and I'm getting an F. 
you know, yeah. and nobody wants an F. And so to me, that's where that sort of has helped me over the years is just fear, you know, fog, fatigue, flirtations. It's going to be one of those four. If you're stuck in innovation, I'm telling you, it's one of those four. And you can go unpack it, reverse it, and off and away you go. What, what else has made you a, a better creative thinker or an innovator? I, I think, um, you know, when I, when I was adopted, I went from the city to the country. I was literally behind Miller Brewing in Milwaukee, hitting baseballs through old windows, to uh, the country where I was the only boy in the house, the oldest, and it was like hands in the dirt kind of work, you know. And I think I've, I've, I've always, I'm always looking to innovate. I'm always looking to improve, I, no matter what it is, right? Um, but I'm willing to do the work. And I'm always willing to validate. Reagan, Ronald Reagan had a great one-liner. He said, trust, but verify. Yeah. You know, and I think that's kind of what I'm saying is like, don't, don't watch the podcast and go, I want to be an innovator. Look, find something worth innovating. Yep. All right. Have that spirit of innovation. Have a team around you that can help you make those strides. And uh, be willing to validate whether you're getting closer or not and make your adjustments. You know, just something that came to my head just now, and, and it goes back to your initial experience and how you got started. And I just, I don't know why this just came to me, but it's kind of random. But I'm a, uh oh. Well, the, the industry we were born from, um, auto, it really struggles finding great people. But when you look at the industry and all the people, that have started in, in the dealer world, and maybe that wasn't the right fit for them, but, but learned a lot and then innovated and found their way. You're a great example of this. The talent's there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do they leverage that? that how do, because this is not just an auto industry problem. Every industry has all kinds of people that were in their organization and then maybe went on and just built something incredible. Mm -hmm. And so what can businesses do to maybe recognize that a little bit better? Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure the dealer group that's looking at using, well, what if we would have just done this? Or what if we could have done that? Mm -hmm. And then... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, yeah. I don't know why that just yeah. kind of came to me and I'm thinking to myself because that's an answer I'd want for my own business because I'm sure it's happened to us as well. Uh, case in point, I remember walking into a consultant friend of mine and he was driving home the same point that basically around you, you have so much value in the store. And we were going to a grocery store real quick to pick up whatever. And he's like, look, he goes, I'll prove it to you. And we go in the grocery store. And he, and he stops at the cashier and he talks to this cashier who has no customer standing here. And he asks her for this best idea. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I'm actually standing here with him. It was super awkward. And she fires off an answer, Scott, with no delay. She's like, actually, it's funny you ask. She said, you know, I've had this idea for a different type of bag for our customers. And she goes into this whole deal. I know. I was looking like you were like... Yeah. Is this really happening? I'm looking around for Alan Funt to walk out like I'm on candid camera. And uh, so anyways, your point is made that we don't lack ideas. We lack people who want to hear ideas. We don't lack good ideas. We lack people who use the two ears they've been given, you know. Um, and so to me, I think you press in, you're intentional, you ask good questions, you have some sort of routine that repeats that, not, hey, I did that one time. Yep. It's like working out once and being fit for life. It's not really a thing, right? Yep. You got to repeat. So um, I, to me, that is the most obvious thing that anybody watching could apply instantly. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you feel like would be important to share with, with everybody? Well, I, you know, there's all, I love, I, I've really enjoyed this and I yeah. love your podcast. Good. Thank you. I, I think it was a brilliant idea, yeah. um, and, and it's just one of the things about you that has made your company what it is today, honestly. Uh, it's very well known and very well received in our space. I think um, sometimes when you hear podcasts like this, it can be maybe come across deep or serious or whatever, and I remember coming up with my kids. We had a couple of PlayStation games or whatever it was, Xbox, I don't know, but the one I loved was the one I could win, and it was NFL Blitz. <laughs> 
I loved NFL Blitz because you could like blow people up and it wasn't your typical Madden football where you had to have all the plays and the cheat codes and yeah. like I didn't have time for that. Right. But but the other stuff I loved. And um, and so it was a game. And what I've seen in business, Scott, is that um, we we um, we work harder when we play than we work at work. Yeah. And but you can change that as a business owner. And the way you do that is by making it a game. Um, Jack Strack ran a company in Missouri back in the early 80s. There's a book called The Great Game of Business. So if you haven't read it, grab it, The Great Game of Business. And what he did is he was basically the guy you just described, the guy that started on the showroom floor yeah. and worked his way up, was a general manager kind of guy. Okay. But the guy... So, so this company owned like 20 different companies. This is early 80s, oil crisis. And what they did is overhaul engines, okay? And um, basically, Jack found out they were going to spin it off because it was the last cash cow they had. And he said, look, he said, you know, people that trusted Jack were like, hey, we're supposed to get married next month. Do you think we should still get married? And Jack was connected to his team. And the other, hey, you know, we're supposed to buy a car. Do you? He's like, I don't know. I can't tell you. So he goes to the executives and he said, look, um, you know, what's the deal? And he ends up buying the company. He does. And it's a, it's a 89 to one debt to equity ratio. When he gets done, they buy the thing for millions of dollars. They turn it around. And today that same company owns New Holland case and about 15 other companies around the world. And what they did is Jack took all the numbers and he put them on when they bought it. He said, well, congrats. He said, you guys are now owners of this company, but I don't know for how long. We're in business for one more day. <laughs> and we have to do is turn that number around where it's 89 to 1 to 89, not 89 to 1 debt to equity. And he said where he was pissed was nobody ever taught him the numbers. Nobody. He said, when I had to go raise that money, I didn't know what debt to equity meant. Nobody ever taught me that. Right. I can tell you how to tear down a, a, a diesel engine blindfolded with an arm tied behind my back. So my question is, you know, in order to make, are you making it fun? Can you make it fun? Great game of business. And then, um, you know, are we teaching our staff? You might not be able to post your profitability for, for whatever reason. I got it. But are they learning how to run the business? Last thing, Carolyn Alvarez was my controller in Houston at Traver Technologies before I sold and Southern gal, she was like a kid's sister to me. And uh, she'd always say, JT, she's like, I know you hate when I ask why. Because she'd always say, why this, why that? And she's real Southern. And, and I said, Carolyn, I don't, I, I, I got to tell you, honestly, I love it when you ask me why. Really? And I said, really? And she said, why? And I said, <laughs> because I know when you know why, you'll figure out how. Yes. I, I love that too. I always, I want... First off, when people ask you why, especially the people you work with, you know that they have a sincere interest in getting it to it. They don't want just the information, all right, I'm supposed to go from here to here. They want to know why because, uh, like what you just said, they have a chance to make it better. And quite honestly, they'll better understand why, you know, when you understand why you're doing it, uh, you do the job better. <laughs> so, Ownership. Yeah. The greatest organizations have staff that think and act like owners. Yep. And, uh, you know, we'll say often, hey, this is your business. That's hey, right. look, I mean, we're struggling. Look at this. Yep. This is our business. I mean, you're, you know, what are we doing? So if you can come to work and feel like you have a piece of it. Now, I'm not telling you we always execute that at the level that I want to. Right. That's a constant, never-ending process. Yeah. But that is the goal. Yep. That's the aim. They're part of the solution. You know, and without them... We really we just have an idea. It's not a company until you know. Like, what do they tell us in science class? You can lean against a wall all day, but you didn't work unless the wall moves. Yeah. Right. The definition of work. Yep. Well, I want to thank John here for what I think is was an incredible, a couple of bias, but I, I think it was an incredible interview. Um, and if the business leaders can't walk away from this and, and take two or three things right out of the gate. And, and apply them, um, then they need to go back and re-listen <laughs> because I, I tons of gold nuggets in there. And I also want to thank the Move Crush Count uh, audience for tuning in again today. Once again, my name is Scott Joseph. I am your host. We'll see you next on the next episode.